Taking the troops home. Thank you for coming out on this beautiful fall day. And everyone here, thank you so much for your real, uh, real workers and uh, for peace and against war. So our, our uh, focus today is on the troop escalation in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Duncan. I'm from UJP, United for Justice with Peace. And I want to thank our other co-sponsors, which are um, American Friends Service Committee, Northeast Region, uh, Massachusetts Peace Action, and UNAC, United, uh, United National Anti-War Committee. And so we uh, are starting a monthly uh, peace program and vigil here on Boston Common with uh, all the multiple wars and threats of war going on simultaneously. Rather than try to respond to every single uh, incident, we are going to be uh, having a monthly rally, which will usually be on the first Wednesday. Um, actually, next month, uh, it will be on the second Wednesday, November 8th, but after that, it will be on the first Wednesday. So we hope to see you um, again and again. So today, we're focusing on Afghanistan. The U.S. began the war on terror by attacking Afghanistan on October 6, 2001. So uh, on Friday, that will complete 16 years of war. Rather than ending terror, a war of terror was unleashed. It has cost thousands of U.S. troops, tens of thousands of Afghan lives, and $2.4 trillion. President Trump, you probably heard his U.N. speech, is continuing the wars of the past decades and making unhinged threats towards Iran, North Korea, Venezuela, and many other countries. This has to stop. So with everything going on, why are we talking about Afghanistan? This is the longest war in U.S. history, and it marks the start of the never-ending so-called war on terror, which has led to many other military actions. And now the Afghanistan war is going to get longer as President Trump recently announced that several thousand more U.S. troops are being sent to that country with a supposedly new strategy, fight the win. This sounds like a different version of the same strategy which has been tried again and again over the years. If things aren't working, send in more troops. This means more Afghan and U.S. casualties and who knows how many more billions dollars spent. And no timetable for U.S. US withdrawal is given. Today, the Taliban in Afghanistan controls about 40% of the country and is on the offensive. On, Sept on September 29th, Taliban gunners shelled the Kabul airport targeting the airplane carrying Secretary of Defense James Mattis. So while the strategy is fight the win, actually the U.S. is fighting not to lose. The only way to win is for the U.S. to withdraw its military forces and support a political settlement with talks including the Taliban, the Afghan government, and other political forces so that the Afghan people can decide their own future. Two days shy of 16 years of U.S. war in Afghanistan. What a terrible and very, very sad anniversary to be observing. Thank you all for being here, for listening, for coming together as a peace community. And I hope gaining strength and inspiration to work for justice and peace. I am a member of September 11th Families for Peaceful Tomorrows. My sister Laura died in the North Tower of the World Trade Center on 9-11. Today I'm thinking a great deal about how the founding of Peaceful Tomorrows took place and the vision we had for an alternative response to the terrorist attacks. In the weeks after Laura was killed, I remember how all I talked about with my family and friends was that we had to wake, make sh work to make sure that nothing like 9-11 ever happened again, anywhere, and that the U.S. must not go to war. 
After I traveled to Ground Zero and witnessed the destruction there, the overwhelming feeling I had was of the very real danger that our world could spin out of control if we took revenge and violence, if we chose the path of revenge and violence. I did want a response. I wanted international police action to find the Al-Qaeda leaders. I expected that financial support for the hijackers would be traced. And eventually, I hoped there would be open and transparent legal proceedings. None of that happened. But more killing in response to the unspeakable violence of 9-11 made no sense to me. I was not just intellectually, but physically, viscerally opposed to war in Afghanistan. When the bombs began falling on Kabul and in the mountainous terrain of that desolate, impoverished nation, I had no idea if it would spell defeat for Al-Qaeda. But I knew for certain there would be thousands of families soon grieving as mine already was. That connection with people in Afghanistan, people I didn't know, but whose grieving I understood became a crucial part of my life. Then I learned of four other 9-11 victims' relatives who would travel to Afghanistan to meet with the families of the innocent civilians killed, the collateral damage of our bombing campaign. Those four travelers and a handful of others who had early and loudly opposed America's war on Afghanistan organized peaceful tomorrows in February of 2002. Our organization takes its name from a speech by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in which he said, the past is prophetic in that it asserts loudly that wars are poor chisels for carving out peaceful tomorrows. All these years later, I am still truly proud and grateful for Peaceful Tomorrow's mission and goals to promote dialogue on alternatives to war, to call attention to threats to civil liberties and human rights that are a consequence of war, to bring those responsible for 9-11, for the 9-11 attacks to justice in accordance with the principles of international law and to promote a U.S. foreign policy that places a priority on diplomacy, human rights, and democracy. In 2009, Peaceful Tomorrows was one of the first organizations to resoundingly criticize President Obama's calling the war in Afghanistan the good war. We cited 10 reasons to end the occupation of Afghanistan. Among them were the devastating levels of civilian casualties, the violence against Afghan women, the destabilization of civilian life, and a growing refugee crisis. But most essentially, that military occupation of Afghanistan. Has done absolutely nothing to end or, or military occupation of Afghanistan has done nothing to end or even reduce terrorism. Those reasons are as true today as they were in 2009, when the war was only eight years old. We cannot give up. We need to end this endless war. Thank you. We square, searching for the bombers. Our plan, War is Not the Answer Vigil, was moved to Harvard Square, where 700 people gathered, silently and powerfully pressing the message of no more victims anywhere. We couldn't imagine that 16 years later, we'd be out here in what might still be the early stages of an endless war. It has been almost 70 years since George Orwell prophetically published 1984. 
recall his vision of endless war on the imperial periphery. We can trace the United States' endless wars back to 1898 and the beginning of its international empire. Or we could go back even further to the Euro-American con conquest of this continent. But our postmodern endless war began with the Carter-Bush alliance with the Saudis, the creation of the Mujahideen, including Osama bin Laden, and their being sent to Afghanistan for a long war, as Jones said, to sap the Kremlin's strategic strength, much as the U.S. was drained during the Vietnam War. Those of you with gray hair will remember that during the Vietnam War, Norman Mailer asked, why are we in Vietnam? The other day on NPR, we were told why we are still in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and so many other countries. A caller said, it's like someone who's been through a series of bad marriages. By the time your fourth marriage has failed, it's time to realize that it's not about them, it's about you. <laughs> Trump's people are saying that we could be in Afghanistan for as long as U.S. forces have been in South Korea. That's 70 years and counting, and we know how good that looks at the moment. Not. The plan is to again increase the number of U.S. and NATO troops fighting in Afghanistan, but they won't say how many more will be sent to kill and die in a futile war. And like Vietnam and Iraq, the green zone that houses the U.S. Embassy, the military, and the so-called Afghan government, the fortress isolated from the rest of Kabul, will be massively increased in size. This will further isolate them from Afghan society, and like Vietnam and Iraq, it's hardly a winning strategy. Like the wars in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Libya, Mindanao, and the Philippines, and before them Vietnam, Cambodia, Panama, the Dominican Republic, Grenada, and so many other countries, the Afghanistan war is a symptom, not a cause. There are many reasons for this endless war. Recall that before the Pentagon Papers, Daniel Ellsberg published a book titled Papers on the War. There he explained that every U.S. president from Eisenhower on knew that the Vietnam War was a lost cause, but they didn't want to lose it on their watch. So three million Vietnamese, countless Laotians and Cambodians, and 58,000 U.S. troops were sacrificed. Untold thousands of others were wounded, poisoned by Agent Orange and other defoliants, and have suffered PSPD. I was with representatives of Vietnam's Agent Orange organization in Hiroshima this past summer. They are still looking for help as that Dow chemical defoliant continues to devastate succeeding generations of Vietnamese as a result of genetic damage. In the last years of the Vietnam War, the Pentagon Papers told us that 85% of the reason the war continued was to maintain U.S. prestige. Massive killing to maintain U.S. prestige. And this is among the reasons that the U.S. and NATO are still at war in Afghanistan and are once again threatening Pakistan. Trump and Mattis don't want to lose Afghanistan on their watch. Why are we still in Afghanistan? Think about oil and natural gas, the prize of World War I, and still the prize of our Middle East wars. Think about why Trump traveled to Riyadh to uh, embrace the Saudi monarchy or why our military contests with China for control of South, of the South China Sea and the intentions that could escalate to the unthinkable. How central are oil and gas? Look to the suffering in Puerto Rico. And recall that to weaken Russia's grip on European and world uh, oil and gas supplies, Afghanistan has long been seen as the route for pipelines from Turkmenistan down to the Indian ports circumventing Russian control. Why are we still in Afghanistan? Because Afghanistan has natural resources, an estimated trillion dollars of booty that Trump wants. We're in Afghanistan because of Afghanistan's strategic, geostrategic location in relationship to Russia and China. Since its inception in, 17, in 1979, the Afghanistan war has been a continuation of the great game of the 1800s. Afghanistan lies on Russia's soft underbelly and on China's western flank. And by supporting India and preventing Pakistan from gaining strategic depth in Afghanistan, Washington is building another resource with which to, counter, to counterbalance China's rising power. Why are we there? Because the Afghan government is divided and corrupt to its bones. Let me, corrupt, let me quote to you from some New York Times article. 
Some of you here will remember Malalai Joya, the Afghan feminist social worker who visited Boston several times. The December 3, 2003 New York Times carried a picture of her addressing the lawyer Jurga that was convened to adopt the new constitution. And the Times quoted her saying, quoted her saying, why she asked the delegates assembled here were her countrymen and women tolerating the presence of criminals who would destroy the country. They should be brought to national and international justice, she said. If our people forgive them, history will not. Malaloy had to, Malaloy had to flee that lawyer Jurga for her life, and she was forced to live in hiding for years to follow. How the Good War in Afghanistan Went Bad was the title of an article in the Times on August 12, 2007, a decade ago. It reported that, quote, two years after the Taliban fell to an American-led coalition, a group of NATO ambassadors landed in Kabul to survey what appeared to be a triumph. They were told that the Taliban were now a spent force. Some of us were saying, not so fast, said Mr. Burns, now the Secretary of, Under Secretary of State recalled. While not a strategic threat, a number of us assumed that the Taliban was too enmeshed in Afghan society to just disappear. But that skepticism has never taken hold in Washington. On October 5, 2008, the Times headlines, quote, reports link Karzai's brother to Afghan heroin trade. Four days later, the Times reported, quote, a draft report by American intelligence agencies concludes that Afghanistan is in a downward spiral and casts serious doubt on the ability of the Afghan government to stem the rise of the Taliban's influence. The classified report finds that the breakdown in central authority has been accelerated by rampant corruption. And a week later we could read, Afghan, Afghanistan airstrike threatens to deepen anger in uneasy populace. That was almost 10 years ago. But just last week, another airstrike killed a detachment of Afghan police in Helmand province. And this follows attacks on wedding parties and countless other civilians. This is not a way to win hearts and minds. Finally, this past August 24th, the Times carried a story titled Recipe for an Endless War in Afghanistan. Here are a few excerpts. It's a combination of state collapse, civil conflict, ethnic disintegration, and multi-sided intervention that has locked it in a, in a self-perpetuating cycle that may simply be beyond conflict or outside resolution. American-led efforts, despite some successes, have ended up reinforcing and re accelerating the broader cycles of violence and fragmentation that have been growing since the state's collapse in the early 1990s. The United States aided peace building, working through local warlords who can find the Taliban and impose order. This strategy undermined the government, alienated Afghani Af Afghans, and further pushed Afghanistan into a collection of fiefs run by strongmen whose interests run contrary to American aims. Friends like Iraq in 1991 and in 2003, the Afghan war has been a murderous war of choice. On the night of 9-11, when Bush's War Council met, Secretary of War Rumsfeld told W that we couldn't just invade Afghanistan. That would be a violation, he said, of international law. How did Bush respond? It was time he insisted to kick some ass. We are still paying for that arrogance. Coming to the end, friend. Let us hope that Trump doesn't really want another war of choice with North Korea, a war whose casualties could easily amount to a million human beings in just the first 24 hours. Let me make by making a connection to the controversy over the courageous football players who have been taking the knee in protest to murderous racist police violence and to the president's racist arrogance. <clears throat> that flag and the false patriotism of Trump and other scoundrels has long been used to hide and cover up murder and countless crimes here and abroad. Since 9-11, they've been used to distract our attention from a series of catastrophic neocolonial wars. Friends, there is a reason that Pete Seeger, during the Civil Rights and Vietnam War era, wrote the torn flag to envision a better design for the stars and stripes and a better vision for our nation. Here's some of what he's saying. I took this striped old piece of cloth and I tried my best to wash the garbage off, but I found it had been used to wrap lies, 
It smelled and stank and attracted all the flies. While I was feverishly at my task, I heard a husky voice that seemed to ask, Do you think you could change me just a bit? Betsy Ross did her best, but she made a few mistakes. My blue is good, the color of the sky. The stars are good for ideals, oh so high. Seven stripes of red are strong to meet all danger, but those white stripes, they need some changing. I also need some stripes of deep rich brown and some of tan and black. Then all around, <laughs> then all around, a border of God's gracious green would look good there. And maybe you could slant the stripes, then I'd not be so square. Friends, in this dark time, when we are confronted by endless war and the not unrelated Trump administration campaign of ethnic cleansing that is reminiscent of Germany in the early 1930s, in a time when our president praises neo-Nazis as good people and condemns those who hold the democracy, as well as elected officials in Puerto Rico, we need to be envisioning and finding creative ways to struggle for another, more peaceful and more democratic United States, like the one Seeger envisioned. Friends, dare to dream, dare to struggle, dare to win, and we shall overcome. We're here today to protest again the endless, ongoing, expanding U.S. wars that have killed and displaced millions for more than 15 years. We're here to protest again endless preparations by the U.S. for wars that swallow up trillions of dollars spent on destructive purpose instead of what we all need, health care, jobs, housing, education. And we're here to protest against the global arms trade in which the U.S. is the largest arms dealer that puts weapons in the hands of despotic regimes fueling endless destructive conflict. The latest one, the U.S. is selling weapons to the Saudis to use in their war against Yemen. Millions of people in Yemen are on the brink of starvation and cholera is running riot with more than 750,000 cases to date. And I can't help but note that the Las Vegas shooter used military assault weapons that should never be manufactured. All too often, the victims of these conflicts are forgotten. The victims of war make us uncomfortable. We don't like to see burned children or people without arms or legs. There are still more than 65 million refugees from these wars. That's what war does and what it means. Intentional, violent infliction of terrible suffering on people, people just like us. We need to end this war on Afghanistan. At least 31,000 civilians have been killed. At least 41,000 have been wounded. We've spent $2.4 trillion and lost several thousand troops. It's one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Iraq is just below it. And it's one of the poorest countries in the world. Millions of people are food insecure. 60% of children under five suffer stunting caused by chronic malnutrition. We should not be sending more troops to Afghanistan, and we should not use bombs like the mother of all bombs, which the U.S. dropped in a mountainous area last April. It is long overdue to end this war. I want to turn some attention to our Massachusetts senators because they just voted for the fiscal year 2018 military budget that tops $700 billion. It's more than the Pentagon asked for. It's more than our tweeter in chief asked for. This is, I call this flyer persuader. The red, that's what goes on the military. Everything else, everything we need. That's lined up down below. You can see it's more than half of U.S. discretionary spending. Lowers the threshold for actual use. We have no say in a decision to use them. The planet and every one of us could be destroyed.
destroyed in one hour. It's unacceptable. It has to change. It's up to us to change it. And as I always say when I'm here at Park Street, it's a joy of my life to stand with you for peace. And I hope to see you next month at 515 on November 8th. Thank you, Thea. Thank you, everybody. And our final speaker will be uh, Cole Harrison from Massachusetts Peace Action. And um, just to repeat what Thea said, our next rally, we're having uh, one rally a month to um, end the endless wars. And Cole Harrison will be our next speaker from Mass Peace Action. Thank you, Duncan. The country of Afghanistan has been through cycles of progress and modernization and reaction for more than a hundred years. We have been at war in that country not since 2001, but since 1978, when a progressive government aroused opposition from, a reaction, from the reactionary forces in Afghanistan. The CIA came in to intervene, the Soviets intervened against that, and we've been involved in there ever since then almost 50 years. That war accelerated in 2001 when we overthrew the Taliban, installed a government called the Northern Alliance that has been in power since then. That war has been wrong politically ever since the beginning because we intervened in one side of a civil war. Well, guess what? Both sides have supporters. Both sides have followers. An outside party cannot fix that, it just makes matters worse. That war has been wrong culturally. RGIs go marching through Afghanistan villages dressed like spacemen with this elaborate equipment on, and they're walking past children that have nothing, that have the most... Afghanistan is one of the poorest countries in the world. It is preposterous to think that our, our troops can liberate that country. 